Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Welcome to episode 123, 123. You can find any links for this episode at the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 123. Has anyone ever said to you about your program, it's just drama, drama, it's just drama, it's just theater, it's not important. It happens all the time, right? I, I, all the time, it happens to me. And, you know, it's because the drama classroom looks different and acts different than all the other classes, and so it must not be like all the other classes, and it must not be useful or important or worthy, and it must not be worthy of being included in the curriculum, which is a big problem because that means drama programs disappear. Except uh, that all drama teachers know the importance of their program, right? The drama classroom is one of the few places where real world life skills are taught. You know them. Same with them, everybody. Communication, self-confidence, self-evaluation, creative thinking. These are the skills everybody, all teenagers, everybody needs beyond the classroom, beyond school, right? A test, testing, one, two, three, testing does not prepare a student for the real world life skills. That's what students need. And my guest today, Chandra Gallant, Artistic Director of the Langdon Theatre Association, she thinks so too. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's get to it. All right. Hello, everyone. I am happy to be sitting here talking to Chandra Gallant. Hello there. Hello there, Shani. That's what your students call you, right? It's true. Hi, how are you doing? (laughs) I'm great. Tell everybody where you are. Well, I'm technically in my house. <laughs> right here in <laughs> okay. Alberta. Alberta. Excellent. And the uh, the reason that we're we're talking uh, here today is that you have done some of our plays. I have. Yes, we really really enjoy your plays and lots of them um, we've used for our our final projects that we do with our group. So, yeah. yeah. And what's your and what is your group? Uh, I work with the Langdon Theatre Association. And um, we're a little program. We meet once a week for a whole year and we work on life skills through theater and we put on a final performance. And that is something which was very interesting to me. The whole the whole notion of using drama to to work on life skills. I think that's actually one of my big mantras, I guess, because I think drama is one of the few places where students are getting any any backing in, in, in life skills. So I'm really interested to talk to you about that. But first, so how did you get into this? What is your background in theater? Uh, Well, I have my BFA and I kind of dabbled in directing, but um, originally I was a stage manager and loved it. And this group actually hired me many, many years ago to stage manage one of their shows. And I was so impressed by how they worked with the kids. And I was super impressed by the kids' um, performance that I wanted to be involved. And they hired me to teach these kids and I've been doing it for over 10 years and they still amaze me. And why why do you think you were drawn to a teaching element as opposed to a performing element? Well, or actually, or staying as a stage manager? Well, I think that uh, I like to be the helper, of course, but I also like to see everything. And I think when you take a step back and you can look at everything, um, you know, especially with these kids, being able to watch them grow from the first read of a play to when they get up on their feet and do it. It's just, I love to see that. And it just, you know, it makes me happy. And I want to encourage that. So let's talk about why this, that's a very specific pathway to say, we teach life skills through drama. Mm -hmm. Why that specific path? Um, Well, we don't want to focus so much. It's not for kids who want to be actors. Mm. It's an extracurricular activity. And, um, you know, not everybody out there wants to be a sports kid. They don't want to do the dance and the, you know, the hockey and that kind of thing. And we wanted to offer them something else. And by doing the life skills through theater, theater is such an amazing, amazing platform that we can really address so many things and kind of get a practice run. at things that we don't Hmm. really get to, you know, practice in life sometimes. 
and it's just so open. We use it in so many different ways and it just became our way of doing things because it is so um, adaptable and we can use it to help the kids through pretty much any problem. And uh, we find that they really enjoy it. They enjoy taking a moment to watch their friends or taking a moment to be the center of attention. Do you, uh, what are the ages that you work with? Um, we go from kids six up until they turn 18. Once they're 18, we have to send them, send them along <laughs> onto their, onto their real life. Um, but yeah, so we have youngins and then we go all the way up to 18. So how do you think you're preparing them for real life? Well, you know, um, I've seen them change and I, I've seen them, you know, learn things, but I think mostly we're, we're creating a self-confidence in them and we're creating, um, teamwork and group work and just kind of the main skills that that will help them to be the best human that they can be so whatever their path you know whatever they want to do some of them yes want to be actors and that's why they're in this performing but some of them just you know are kids that may grow up and may go to university may not and we see them being able to um they create really good well they get good listening skills they're adaptable we try and help them learn the balance between, you know, help them to not be stressed, to deal with those things. Hmm. Problem solving, I guess, is really what it kind of narrows down to. But listening skills is huge. And that one really helps with all the other skills. So how do you do that? How do you promote listening skills? Well, these kids are really awesome. And we have, we split them into four groups just to kind of divvy up the age ranges because the six-year-olds seem to work better with other six-year-olds and the 18-year-olds, you know, work better with those those ages. So we have four groups and they each have their own teacher. And the teachers are um, theater professionals, whether they're directors or actors or stage managers. And they meet once a week. And one thing that we always do is a group check-in. So the beginning of class, the kids sit in a circle. We always do a circle so that everybody can see everybody's face and no one's the head of the table. And they check in. They're like a little family. They tell each other what's going on in their lives, their highs, their lows. You know, sometimes they just do one word to describe how they're feeling in that exact moment. And um, so the kids know how their group is doing. So they're learning empathy, sympathy, that kind of stuff. And then obviously through theater games, they get a lot of great experiences and they can practice their loud voices and their quiet voices. They can try different emotions. They can pretend to play, you know, different characters that they don't always get to be, but maybe they want to experience those emotions and those feelings. I wonder if it's um, because I, I we talk to a lot of teachers where the thing that they emphasize is how their theater class is a safe space. Absolutely. And I wonder if it's even more of a safe space when you go to an uh, it's an extracurricular where there might be there might not be any kids from your school. So you could actually open up without retaliation is not the right word, but <laughs> you but you know if if you're if you are able to share openly with a group and then you never see them during the, the you know until that exact same thing do you find do you find that that you learn that some of your students are very different in in your your group than they are in their other parts of their lives? Oh, absolutely. It's strange because you know we get some kids, their parents bring them to us and say, "Oh, he's a ham at home. We want uh. him to be in theater." And we're like, "Oh, well, here he's quite shy and he's learning to open up and he's learning to project." So kids, of course, just like anybody are different humans depending on their situation and their, you know, the group that they're with. We all kind of change depending on, uh, you know, what the situation is. In Langdon, there's a bunch of different schools and um, we also have kids that come from other areas. So yeah, these kids sometimes don't see each other for a whole week. Some of them are in school together. Some of them are homeschooled. So it is a safe place and they're almost creating their own little community. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is, which is so important. Well, just that whole notion of, of, communication and collaboration. Yeah. So when you're um when you're working with students and they're there for the whole year, sort of what's the process? Like do you do you do a show? Do you start with like icebreakers and and theater games and then you build up to a show? So how are you incorporating taking this community and moving it forward throughout a year? That's that's a great question. Um obviously each teacher has their own kind of way of doing things, but in general, the first couple of weeks of class are getting to know each other, getting everybody comfortable with each other, creating that safe place. 
And we actually just performed for each other. We do kind of a Christmas showcase for the parents. Um, so the kids work on theater games, getting comfortable, and they also work on something to present at this Christmas showcase. And it doesn't have to be like a scene or a skit or a play. One of the groups actually just showed us some of their theater games that they play, and it was really awesome. And the whole point of this is to, A, let them have a chance to be in front of an audience and practice those confidence skills and those speaking skills. And also for the parents to kind of see where we're at. I know parents kind of wonder, they drop their kids off and they pick them up and I'm sure it's like school. What did you learn today? And the kid's like, ah, oh, stuff. So the parents get to see, you know, what their student is doing and they get to see their child in the community that, you know, is their group. So we do the Christmas showcase, and then after Christmas, this is where you come in, Lindsay, is that <laughs> yay, <laughs> yay, we um we pick plays, and um we pick plays that we feel have good morals and are appropriate to our motto of life skills through theater, and we rehearse these plays, and um, then we do a final performance for the parents um, in April or May. So that's kind of our process. So still doing all those theater games, still doing those important check ins, but also rehearsing. So how does a rehearsal process look for you for you guys when your focus is life skills through drama, but at the end of it, there has to be a product? How do you balance process and product? Well, it's definitely process over product. We do do the end performance and we, and we do it in a theater to kind of make it fun and wonderful, but we're not focused on the performance. We all know, as in life, that nothing is ever perfect and we only get one chance to do the end product in front of an audience. So we know it's not going to go, you know, the way we all imagine in our heads. Um, and that's okay. One of the other things we work on is forgiveness and obviously instant forgiveness and in acting. If something goes horribly wrong, the people on stage smile and nod and, and you keep going. And to be able as a, as a child to have instant forgiveness, not just for yourself, but for your peer who has messed up the line, um, is something that we really do work on a lot so that, um, so that the end performance goes as smoothly as it can. But it really is about the process. So we still have a check-in. We'd rehearse the lines, obviously. Um, talk through the play. What does it mean? Why would those characters do that? Has anybody been in a situation like that? Share a story and really try and find, you know, kind of the meat of what the authors have written and try and portray it to the best of our ability. There's lots of story time, which, you know, in school we'd say, oh, not a story. But here we, we want to hear those stories. We want to understand how they're feeling and maybe be able to relate it to characters. <laughs> Isn't that interesting where it's like, you know, no, it's not, it's not story time for you. It's, it's, but it's, that's a, an, an encouraged thing. Well, cause student, well, you know, students are, are, are told throughout the day to, to sit down and be quiet and listen and, mm -hmm. and not share what's going on inside of them in the majority of their classes. Yeah, it's true. And I think that's where theater, it's a lovely, it's a lovely mechanism because it's so organized in the fact that you have to have everything memorized and get in the right order and you have lights and sound and all these things. But it's also so free and that they're exploring a character. Every time they say the line, it could come out differently and someone's going to respond to them differently. And by using those stories and by using their experiences, you know, they get to make it their own. I love that. I love that notion of organized and free because so many people, when they when they walk into well a, a, a theater classroom, the last thing they see is organized, and <laughs> and yet that's exactly right. Like there are so many there are there are steps that need to happen in a play in order for it to reach its conclusion. Absolutely, and I think that I think that's why it's such a lovely, lovely balance. And balance is another big key thing that we're trying to teach them is that, you know, you have to balance not only your life and your schoolwork and your friends, but just yourself as a person. You have to make sure that you're doing things to make you happy, but also that you're not harming other people. So balance is such a key thing. And just, and just being able to be confident and sure of yourself that you can explore and that you can share in order to, you know, do the best, the best job you can. So there's two things that you've, you've said that I, I really want to get into more. One is that notion, the notion of balance and also the notion of forgiveness. Are these two things that you, that you and your, and your teachers are, they're just incorporating in their, in their language and in their, and just in terms of repeating it during, during a class and during the year, or do you have specific exercises that kind of um, highlight these principles? 
Well, like I said, each teacher does their own way of doing things. And like I will be, I get to direct one of your shows and I will definitely include those things. And it, it does kind of depend on the age range. You know, if you try and talk to six-year-olds about balance, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to go very well. They'll be like, but, we're the beam, the balance beam. Can I yes, like... the balance beam. They might get it if it's a teeter-totter. Who knows? But um, So how do you but, do it with a younger kid? How do you do it? Well, with the little kids, and I don't teach them as much, um, even though I think they're probably one of the funnest groups just because they're so imaginative. I think that it's about it's about making sure that there's games where there's taking turns and that there's games where people lose, which may mm. sound a bit harsh, but you have to be able to be to be out, to be wrong and be able to walk to the side and wait for your other group members to finish the game, right? There has to be that. So um, I don't know if you what drama games you play, but we play Director's Daughter quite a bit, which Ooh. teaches the children the the stage directions. So okay. like upstage left and all these things. But we kind of throw in a few things. It's like the boat game. But being able to be told, oh, you're out, um, makes it okay to be wrong. And, you know, like sometimes they have to sit out, which it's not fully balanced, but it kind of teaches them that it's not always going to be them, 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 them. I think, you know, six-year-olds have a hard time not being the center of someone's world right yes because they're still the center of their world and they haven't quite learned that believe it or not (laughs) even though your your moment revolves around you the whole world doesn't revolve around you so with the little guys yet lots and lots of games and not we're not saying at the end of the game that was about balance it's very (laughs) subtle it's very maybe maybe we should and now the lesson for your class the moral of that game children was um but so they're kind of getting those experiences through like indirectly like indirect games um i'm trying to think of other games right now but i can't just because it it's been a while since i taught those little guys okay but so as we, the ones that you that you're more involved with and how does that change for when they get older well, the older guys, obviously, they they have a bit more that you can talk through it and they understand a bit more. Um, but they also do well when you get them to guide each other. So it's hard. Um, it's It's hard to share and it's hard to be the leader and it's hard to be a follower. But if they take turns doing all of these roles, um, then they kind of learn that. They learn that forgiveness and they learn that balance that... You know, if they're the director for one scene, um, they're going to hope that their performers in that scene are doing their best. And then the next week when they're the actors in a scene and they're being directed, you know, so they kind of gain the balance like that. And also forgiveness, you know, it's it's easier to forgive. um, Well, not for everybody. Some people have a really hard time forgiving themselves. But if you're working with your friends and your friends directing you and you've messed something up or you haven't memorized your lines as you were supposed to, they have to work through that together. And, you know, they talk about it. They talk about, you know, whether they're grumpy at someone else because they didn't do their job. And uh, it just it's really about opening up conversation and letting that conversation happen. And, um, you know, after our showcase, we had another class where we just talked about what went well, what didn't go well. And not that they would blame each other, but, you know, saying, well, so and so didn't come in at their cue and it messed me up and say, OK, great. So how can we fix that? Um, we have to be able to trust each other on stage and, you know, that's a big part of it. If someone's never there when you need them, we got to talk through that. It's, uh, it's, you know what I find, I find a, a lot of more and more I'm meeting students who, who aren't able to forgive themselves and who are, they get in that moment on stage and it's, um, it's, it's, it's so, it's so troubling. And yet, and then I've also seen, I've seen what you've you've discussed about how when when someone's messed up, others come to their come to their arrival, come to their aid. aid. It's it's word of the day over here at the podcast. Um, and I think that is that is the most amazing thing that I think you can teach a student is to particularly in, in a theater situation is if someone's having trouble to to find a way to to leave the script because you have to, okay, we're, we're not in the lines now. We have to come to somebody's, we have to help the play move forward. Absolutely. And I think that that's where, you know, they work together as a team and it's those team building skills that they're not going to jump on someone else's lines, but if they're struggling, they're going to throw something in there. They're going to, they're going to push through and make it happen. And, you know, we do a lot of that through improv games. We work on those kind of skills. 
How long does it take, uh, do you find, because you're working with, it must be that some of your students, you're working with them um, year after year. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. And how long does it take to, to build these communities with your students? Well, it's funny because, you know, uh, I feel that at depending on the age group, again, the older kids always seem to move a little faster and that's kind of a given. But at Christmas time right now, like the one group, one of my teachers, her group is solid. Like they are a team. They support each other. They, you know, they run their lines when they don't have to. They text mm-hmm. each other and say, hey, let's do this. And they're just an amazing group. So it could take, you know, a few months, but sometimes it takes the whole year. And then when we start again, you know, we have summers off and we start again in September, you're going to have new group members in your group. So it's we're starting to build a new community with another group. And I think that's part of the process, too, is just being able to be open to people and, and, and learning to trust them and that kind of thing. So it could be months. It could be a year. Oh, it's not like it's math. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite story of like, because you've been doing this for over 10 years now. So there must be, you know, is there there's a reason that you stay? Yes, for sure. You know what? I have so many stories. Um, I'll try and to give you the Coles notes version because I just these kids make me so happy. We had one little guy um, when I started teaching. He must have been about I want to say six or seven, and he had an incredible stutter. It just you know he just couldn't get any words out without the stutter happening. And his mom had taken him to a couple of different speech therapy classes and done a whole bunch of that stuff, and it hadn't helped him at all. And it wasn't like an overnight turn. He was probably in class for two years before we kind of realized, because we watched an old video, that his stutter was gone. Hmm. Like it had happened over, you know, a a long time. And we just were so there with him that he became a part of our community. I didn't even realize, you know, that he had had the stutter still. And we watched a video from his first year performance where it was, you know, very obvious. And it was gone. Like he, he just worked through it on his own. And it's, it, I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes when kids are on stage and they're portraying a character, the little things that they have in real life, whether they have a twitch or whether they get super quiet, those things go away. So his character didn't have a stutter, but he as a little boy, you know, still once in a while would have a stutter. Anyway, it's just amazing that he was so comfortable that that was not what he was thinking about and it went away. I love that. I love it too. I, I love, well, I just, you know, it's that, it's that moment when um, the light bulb goes off or um the the actor the the student who says i could i never go on stage goes on stage and to me this is that's what that's what drama and education is it's it's not it's not math or science it's 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 sort of developing a human being yeah and i think i think you hit it on the head that's what it is and you know, it's not like we're focusing, let's get rid of the stutter. We're focusing no. on, the, on the human. We're developing this little person to be kind and sensitive and adaptable and all these kind of skills. And then that's when they amaze us and they get on stage or they, you know, whatever it is, whether it's stage or whatever he needed to do that day. And he did it with confidence. So in your your own process of, of working with students and developing your own process. Mm-hmm. What do you what are you struggling with in terms of teaching drama and educ- and having it this drama and education focus and, and having this life skills focus? What are what are a couple of struggles that you see on a regular basis? Well, we always struggle with, you know, we're telling the kids to be open and to be free, but as the authority, the teacher in the room, you can't just let things go crazy, right? Mm. And it's always, we always ask them to be respectful and appropriate, but sometimes there are things that kids want to talk about that are inappropriate. And so there's, you know, there's a funny balance there. So you have to, again, you got to find the happy medium where parents aren't going to be like, what were you talking about in class? And then also, you know, encourage them, talk to your parents about that. The other one I have a hard time with is, um, is that, because it is theater and our focus is life skills, we do get those kids in the class that are there and they just want to be performers. Mm. They want to be the shining stars. And, and because of the way we run our program, when we, when we cast our, our roles, we don't cast them for, like I said, it's not for a good show. We're not here to do Broadway. We're about the process. So it's, it's maybe not for everyone, which is hard to say. Um, but it, you know, it's not, we're not trying to create perfect actors. No, but you're, it's, it's the growth, it's the, if the growth happens, really, who cares what the performance is like? Absolutely, absolutely. That's what it is. Yeah. 
Okay, and then as a last question, so if you look into the future, you know, five years, ten years from now, what is your ideal theatrical life? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I still hope to be doing this. I hope mm -hmm. to be directing these kids and, and having classes with them where, you know, they teach me something probably every class and working with these amazing teachers that I work with that um, are just so encouraging. You know, it, it's also about the teachers. We all have such different backgrounds that we pick up on different things. And then when we do get together as a big group, you know, we're, we're such a good balance for each other and such a, you know, great support system for the kids that we all, we're all approachable for different things. Um, I, I wish, I wish we could have more classes, you know, yeah. we, we can only have four groups because of our space limitations and that kind of thing. So, so I think I just need to win the lottery and build a space and build a big space and yeah, find a bunch more teachers and that, you know, feel the same way and, and understand that we're about the human growth and we want to see kids, you know, be confident in themselves, but. Yeah, and just finding great parents too, you know. Uh, our board our board of directors is amazing and these parents get their kids to class every week, right? Like that's it seems like a simple thing, but it it's, <laughs> it's so important, right? Like if yeah. the parents like, "Meh, we're not doing it." Then so it's just I just I hope that this can keep happening and that everybody understands what an important role it plays in, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's a must, but these kids, I think when they're adults will be will be really cool, honest fun humans, you know? Well, where else are they going to learn it? Like if, if, if our focus in school is testing, that's great, but we don't do a lot of testing in the real world. We, we talk to each other and we have to work with each other and we have to have ideas and then we have to implement those ideas. Like where is that happening? If not in drama? Well, and that's it, right? Like they're doing this test in class and then all of a sudden they're in a, they're in the real world and they have to solve a problem. If they haven't practiced it, whether they failed when they practiced or not, what are they going to do, right? So it's important. It's important to practice and, you know, and it's important to fail and try these things before before you get there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It was a, it was a real pleasure talking to you and, and, and uh, just and learning, what, and learning what you do. And uh, we're, we're big. We are very big supporters of, of the whole drama through life skills through drama notion. And uh, I wish you all the best in your, in your future with this. Well, thanks so much for having me. And I, I, I support the cause fully. So I hope that people are hearing this and understanding that we're, we're trying to make it, make it amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. I can tell we are on the same page. I think you can tell too. We were on the same page. So before we go, let's do some theater folk news. It's play feature. It's play feature. It's time to feature a play. So today we have Rainbows versus Bunnies Annihilation. <laughs> okay. So this is a new play by regular theater folk playwright Bradley Walton. And I have to tell you, every time I read the title or I see the title, it makes me laugh. And for me, that's a good start. A lot of our plays... Um, well, you know, let's be, let's be frank. We're not the, the, we don't have the death of a salesman. We don't have the, the well-known musicals. Um, people have to get into our plays to read them and connect to them. And, you know, we do a good job of making sure that everything in the theater folk catalog is for middle school, for high school, you know, that going in, but then to actually open the door to a play, you need a, a very inviting door. And I think titles, they are the, the entryway into getting someone to read a play. And, uh, I really hope that Rainbows vs. Bunnies Annihilation opens a lot of doors because I think it's a great title. It's a good start. I love it. And uh, so what, what's going on in this play? Well, did you know that Rainbows and Bunnies for centuries have been locked in a bitter rivalry, bitter struggle to make people happy? And that teenager Aaron, who is failing history, is right in the middle of their struggle and strife. And that's really all you need to know. There are bunnies. There are rainbows. They are fighting teenagers in the middle. What is he going to do? So uh, go to theaterfolk.com for sample pages. Find out. Read. You can read majority of the play for free on our uh, website. 
Uh, or get the link at the show notes, theaterfolk.com forward slash episode one, two, three. Do it. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk, and you can find us on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.